soup. My guy was always better, though. I never did the road to the show. Yeah. I just did a creative player, 99 everything, and that was disgusting. No, not power hitting. I liked always to be, like, a really good contact guy. Like, Shortcuts. mid-20s home. Yeah, yeah. No, I used to make... Closest sw- to 400 since Tony Gwynn. Switch hitter, one side power, one side contact. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of like me in real life. Okay. Yeah. When was the last time you played baseball that wasn't underhand? Oh, God. 13? <laughs> <laughs> back at 13, back of your baseball card, man. I, do you guys do that for your softball league? Do you guys put your stats on a website? that They do have the, a stat. Yeah, they have course. an MVP, and they sure. like put it. I won MVP the other day, like, a couple weeks ago. It was pretty neat. For the league or just for the game? Yeah. They put it on Instagram, but I didn't want to flex too hard and put it up. But I could have, so I just remember that. I respect that about you. You're like, I'll let you guys have your fun, but I'm not promoting this for myself because that's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't even, it was like four for four or four singles. If I hit nukes, then I would have been like. Right, yeah. Yeah. Like, can't be a slap hitter. So you're literally my guy in M- MLB The Show. Pretty much. Living out you, my dream. I, I have a distinct memory of my Little League career when I I never hit a home run before. Crank one. I think it's gone. Look at it. Take a couple steps. You know, I was trying to admire it. Hits the fence. This close to getting gunned out at first. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that, man. Uh, base hit to right field and you just gun them out judge does that all the time i only had one hit in my little league career but it was a walk-off oh nice yeah like jeter exactly yeah Yeah, i retired with one hit (laughs) and i won the game ball look at that wow and you know what i was using pete pomerico's bat so i always felt like i stole his power for just that one hit like mike exactly like pete like pete and then all of a sudden i went home with all the ladies and (laughs) (laughs) Just 11, 10 years old. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Soup Podcast. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to really just talk about a couple of stories here. We're going to be reviewing, as you could see on the title, Thor, Love, and Thunder. And we'll also be talking some U.S. box office, uh, early reviews for Jordan Peele's Nope which is coming out this weekend. I'm sure some of you have already seen it. Uh, Yeah, and you can listen to the podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, all the homes for podcasts, and of course on YouTube. Uh, Depending, uh, This might be going up on the Nerd Soup Podcast channel, but that's going to be a game time decision for me. Yeah, figure it out. It's coming up. One of these weeks, it really might be this one, so make sure you promote it, Aaron. And the listeners at home, get those promotions out. Do both. I mean, Thor... It's a big enough review. I think people would... Okay, so we're making that decision now, not even a game time. <laughs> I don't know. You just vetoed that? Hey. Are you president of the Senate for Nerd Soup? Yes. You still don't have that power. That makes Teddy the speaker. <laughs> you can't even speak. <laughs> and follow us on social media at Nerd Soup on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all those places. And at Bo Soup, at Nerd Soup Monkey, and uh, at Stu Gives. Let's give Stu a little plug here. He hasn't gotten a plug in years. I miss Stu. Yeah, he's doing, he's doing stuff. He, d- he posts a lot about finance. Mm. That seems to be his big thing. Um, I hope he's right because I've been taking some of his <laughs> advice. I checked my Coinbase the other day because I like Ooh, bad yeah, move. Not great. Well, I have a friend who thinks uh, Bitcoin's going to bottom at 12k. I'm like, all right, that's not a bad bottom. That's not a bad bottom. We could work up from that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's not talk about it. Let's yeah. not talk about it. I think that's why Christian Bale took on this role as Gore in Thor Love and Thunder. I'm yeah, just going to use that joke for every yeah. prestige actor who takes on one of these blockbuster roles <laughs> that they put all their money in crypto and needed a nice little payday. But we might as well just get right into it, right? Thor Love and Thunder, the fourth Thor movie. He's the first hero in the MCU to get that coveted fourth movie. For a long time, people thought it would be Iron Man, but then he died. Mm. Um, so he this- has like four other movies. Yeah, you can really just add up Civil War, Infinity yeah. War, Avengers. I remember my brother-in-law said that to me. He was like, Avengers is just an Iron Man movie because he's the only one good at acting. <laughs> um, and they did really, they've gotten better since that first Avengers movie. I mean, they obviously changed Thor's character around, but you could see it with like Evans and Hemsworth that they've they really learned to kind of be as good as Robert Downey Jr. as the movies went on, <laughs> or up to that level. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Thor, obviously with Ragnarok, they they changed the character around, and it was very well received by many fans. Uh, a funny movie, space adventure, and this was 
kind of similar, similar vibes, similar, uh, I think, themes of Thor once again trying to discover who he actually is. You're Thor. Oh, shit, look at that. And Jane's Thor. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's, oh, the, that's, that's the problem. a little problem here. Yeah. I like that idea. You know, post-Endgame, Phase 4 has been kind of wandering. There's no clear direction, uh, which reminds me a lot of Phase 1. And I think a, a lot of people don't realize that not all those earlier phases had hits no misses you know i think it's it was mostly phase three yeah which was the one where none of these movies were even close to being mediocre so when you're putting out this much content some of them are just not going to be good um and i think that you can argue for me it's between this and black widow as to what's been the bottom of phase four because i did not enjoy this movie i hate to say there are definitely aspects of it i I enjoyed but overall for me there was more bad than good and i felt like it lost a lot of that charm that it built in ragnarok and i think maybe characters like loki hulk uh jeff goldblum (laughs) their absence was felt yeah especially when it came to the humor no i I think this like i I don't even put this in ragnarok's class but like it's not even in the same room. And it's weird because I heard all the uh, criticism and I saw, like, we saw the movie a little bit later uh, than most people. So, but going into it, I was like, I'm, I'm probably still going to like it because I like Taika Waititi and I like what he did with Ragnarok and all of his other films. And I've liked the way Chris Hemsworth has really come into this character over the past few movies he was in. And still, I was just like, yeah. I, I did not enjoy this film at all. I think that, you know, and I, I, I kept seeing this criticism online, and it was kind of infuriating me. Well, not a criticism, actually, uh, in defense of Thor. It's like, people, like, just turn your brain off. It's a comedy. It's not, don't expect high cinema. It's like, you know, you like, comedy can be high cinema, right? Because you know the director of this movie has made a comedy high cinema before. It's like his in whole thing. In multiple instances. He's won Oscars. Yeah. He just won an Oscar for doing exactly that, according to most yeah. people. Like, and I was just like, oh, so like Dr. Strangelove, great comedy. Not cinema, though. It can't be, because it's a comedy. Yeah, that is true. Because apparently two can't be true at the same time. Mean Girls. So, pff, yeah. I didn't even have to go back that far. No, yeah, 2004, baby. So, like, that being used as a defense, I found was was just idiotic. But, I, you know, I still thought maybe I wouldn't, like, I'm going to enjoy this. I like Taika Waititi, and I just didn't feel this film was as tight as Ragnarok because I, I, I think the biggest thing that I, I like right when I left the film like the biggest thing that like I started thinking about is like why was this so short you needed 20 more minutes seriously dude and the MCU continues to frustrate me with that you have you putting all these ideas in the trailer Thor is going to be with the Guardians Jane Foster is now Mighty Thor you have Christian Bale one of the most acclaimed actors of his generation playing the villain mm-hmm. all these cool things that you think that they're really going to dive into and they don't and ends up just being like you said a quick two hour film that definitely needed uh, another for me like almost 30 minutes yeah, because definitely. you have Bale as Gore the God Butcher you needed more with him because I thought he was the best part of the movie when he was there and Jane like her getting well, she goes to New Asgard touches Mjolnir and then does that thing and next thing you know she's Thor right and they cut out apparently they cut out the scene where she actually does transform into Thor like something like that something <clears throat> in the in between like we just get her and she's this new character her personality has changed and like not not like fully but like there's something different about her and they don't really do a good job of connecting that bridge and <laughs> i think with that you know we needed like at least 10 more minutes of jane and to really sell that relationship because you mentioned before even started recording their chemistry is still not there no they so when the scene yeah. when she's trying out all the catchphrases and he's giggling i almost had to look away mm-hmm. because <laughs> i don't know with natalie portman is obviously a good actor but sometimes that doesn't necessarily translate to being a blockbuster movie star. And maybe they did her dirty by not giving her enough time, by showing us the transformation of why she's worthy. And also the point of Thor putting the, you know, he whispers to the hammer, you need to protect her. So that's why the hammer went to her. It would have been nice to see her earning it on her own. You know, that she is this very decent person who's worked her whole life to make humanity better right so that in thor's absence because thor's trying to find himself the hammer would choose her to show that she could be the new protector yeah and that moment ends up being very un- underwhelming when you first see her she looks great in the costume that was definitely a positive i thought all the get-ups yeah. for the two thors were very well done but no their relationship uh once again you the best their relationship was in that in this movie was the montage of yes. when they're together watching movies eating ice cream going on bike rides 
uh, and then that's over, you know? So that, to me, that would have been the better movie, right? The in-betweens. If we're not going to necessarily move the phase four forward with these stories, then give me kind of domestic Thor. I, I would have loved that. You know, a superhero trying to live his domestic life and having to go off and do the job. Yeah. Like a little in-between type of movie, you know, Lion King one and a half type of stuff. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, and but my biggest criticism of the movie is going to be gore because when you have an actor like Christian Bale and you waste him like this, he was so good in the scenes he was in. He was creepy. I love the look of the character. I love the way he talked. But he kills one god. Yeah. That could have been a multi-layered philosophical approach to this film. Why do we need gods? Gods are selfish. Gods turn their back on us. Uh, that could have been really interesting, just not only for, you know, Marvel, but for real life. You could have related it to so many different things, and uh, you barely spend any time with this guy. Yeah. And I wanted to see him fight. I wanted to see him massacring gods. Those fights could have been epic. You know, you see the corpse of the giant god that he killed, and it's like, how awesome would that fight have been? <laughs> yeah. How did he do that? No, and it's very surface level with all that of how the gods turn their back on the people yeah. who follow them. And, uh, yeah. And also, like, just, even the opening scene, like, oh, we've seen it so many times. You know, this is, is why he's bad. The scene was very, I thought it was a good scene up until we see that, that god. And, like, I just thought that was so. And you're going to get wackiness at Taika Waititi. We've seen it before, but I think this one's a little bit too unhinged. And it kind of just goes all over the place. Um, it's not as. Like Ragnarok, I think, was the perfect blend of using his humor and kind of um, having it fit in with the story. I, I think this was kind of disjointed in that regard. Um, and also, I think the musical cues were very underwhelming, as were the fight scenes. I think yeah. he tried to recreate the immigrant song scene and like multiple different times, and none of them hit. Although November Rain was actually my favorite one at the end. I thought I just love that song, but it just didn't <laughs> have like, that good song. It just didn't have that same impact as no. uh, the immigrant song did in the previous movie. So, um, yeah, overall, I just left the theater just kind of like uh, you know, it had its moments, but I was just very, <laughs> very underwhelmed in a lot of instances. Yeah, I mean, he obviously made Thor funnier than he was in Ragnarok. So he was always this fish out of water, and that's where you got a lot of the humor. And I think he kind of combined both of those things where, yeah, we're going to give Thor, he's going to be a bit more clever mm -hmm. with his humor in Ragnarok, but it's still kind of this, I'm trying to figure out how to be a hero, and that's where a lot of the, the humor stemmed from. And him trying to, once again, re repatch the relationship with Loki. I think Loki's absence was definitely felt. So when so much of the humor is concentrated on just Thor making quips and making witty remarks, it, it ends up growing old after a while, where mm -hmm. Thor can never have just a sort of serious moment. And he had a few of them with Jane, where he admits that, yeah, I love you, that's why I don't want you to keep transforming into Thor. But once again, their relationship is not established. It's been three movies mm -hmm. with these two characters. It's not established enough to really make those moments hit. And, I think, and the whole theme of, uh, sorry to cut you off, yeah, no, of you trying off to first. find, you know, getting over the past and, uh, you know, finding new purpose, finding new love, that wasn't developed enough to sort of justify that ending. To me, that ending was so wacky. No, the emotional <laughs> payoff, like the lack of emotional payoff was pretty shocking. Yeah. Um, and like, it, it's all there. I mean, like literally one of your characters is dying from cancer, like one of the more serious aspects. And if you look at a movie like Guardians, even though it happens in a different way and that's shown in the beginning of the film, I think the emotional payoff, the movie had all that wackiness and all the crazy adventure, but the emotional payoff at the end is what I feel like really hits and wraps it up. And this just was lacking in that regard. Yeah. I, I really, what hurts the movie is that it's just not funny. So you're watching I, 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 it's joke after joke yeah. after joke after joke. People, Some people had this problem with Ragnarok, but yeah, I, I couldn't... There was no moment that had me laughing out loud like I was when Thor jumps off the ship and lands on the bridge. Or There's so many different moments from Ragnarok that are just so iconic now. There's none that really stick out in my head. I think the funniest the movie got was when Russell Crowe showed up as Zeus. Yeah. And it was more so just seeing Russell Crowe as Fat Zeus. Yeah. And the way he was dancing with the thunderbolt. <laughs> All that was funny. But uh, And then you get the sweet child of mine music cue with the screaming goats who have been very controversial. Was not a fan. No. Um, I knew about the goats going into it. I'm like, I'm probably going to like this. And I didn't like it. Um, <laughs> they were wailing. <laughs> It's weird because this is the first Marvel movie I've seen in a while that was an opening night. So maybe that experience, theater experience, everyone laughing would have, you know, helped me laugh a little bit. But I, I barely even like cracked a smile during this movie. 
Uh, I think like some of the humor with the Molnir and Stormbreaker and that I thought it was yeah that was that yeah. was it was cute like I I, I was watch, like I recognized like okay that's kind of funny but like I didn't like outwardly ever laugh at anything right you you took like the breathing through your nose laugh. Yeah, like, hmm. yeah. yeah that's a lot of hums mm-hmm. so. even a character like Korg I thought he had so many funny lines in the previous movie and here he was just it drax them. They did drag him, right, where he's just stating the obvious or uh, very deadpan <laughs> with his uh, funny little voice. I guess uh, the moment where Tessa Thompson pulled out the hand grenade, that was kind of funny. Jane thinks it's a hand grenade, and she's like, no, it's just a Bluetooth speaker. <laughs> <laughs> they just start bobbing their heads. But yeah, no, other than that, I-, I think that the MCU has shown that they're rushing these movies, they're rushing these shows, so the story's not going to be as tight, the humor's not going to be as funny, and the special effects aren't going to look as good. And I don't think there was that much of a problem when it came to the CGI in this movie. There are definitely some frames that people have been pointing out where it's like, what is this? This looks like shit. You know, there's a better way that you can film this. But at times, it still does kind of look fake. Uh, And I think that there's definitely a problem with that where you wonder how much of the budget is now going to paying all of these actors rather than making sure your CGI looks realistic. And I think, uh, you know, working them up to the deadline has hurt these projects. I would not be surprised if Wakanda Forever comes out and it has similar problems where it's like, whoa, this feels like a rush product. I mean, I was going to needed another six months to kind of shore this thing up. Yeah, like I, like I said, we saw it a little bit later, so like I've heard all the criticism, so I was keeping an eye out on it. Um, the helmet wasn't too distracting, and no, the fact it wasn't. that it was like a kind of a nanotech or whatever, uh, yeah. probably as Guardian tech, makes sense why it's not actually why she wasn't wearing it. Um, the scene when uh, Axel co- connects to him and you see his face. <laughs> I mean, people were posting the camera off their iPhone at a movie theater, and was it perfect? Was it great? No, but it wasn't anything I was, like, appalled at. Um, and uh, other than that, like, nothing really stood out as bad CG. Uh, the the first God in the beginning was a little bit noticeable. But, you know, uh, I still think it looked... Like, some of the scenes uh, in the third act, when they get to the place with, uh, with no light, I thought was shot very well. Like, stuff like that. Yes, yeah, so it, it seems like they... The shadow realm. Yeah, so like maybe they just were like, okay, we need we need to f- focus all our, most of our attention on this to make sure that we get this right. Because I do think like the way they use shadow and the way they use the light illuminating from Molinier and to reflect in its uh, what any, everything like in its vicinity, I thought it was actually really done well. And that's probably like my favorite part of the movie is that whole like third act. But um, yeah, I think when once they confront Gore yeah. and he's got them all tied up and he's you know, do, doing his evil speeches. He was great in those moments, but I, I wish you just would have gotten more from this character from just let him live up to his name. Yeah. Those fight scenes could have been incredible. And even if you brought the Guardians a- along for that ride, you know, Thor and the Guardians are trying to stop this fucking madman and Thor learns more about the falls, uh, the falls, the flaws of all these gods. You know, he, he talks about how he worships Zeus and then he gets to see what Zeus actually is, that he's this hedonist. He doesn't really care. You know, he's, he's more concerned about the orgy than anything else. Yeah. I, I wish you could have, you know, put Thor in more of those situations that, yes, yeah, some of these gods, maybe they do deserve to die because mm-hmm. of what they've done. And I, I think that could speak to, you know, the, the way that power does corrupt Obviously, they're not immortal because they can be killed. So are they actually gods? You know, that's what Captain America says in The Avengers. But this character, yeah, he is creepy and he's scary. But, you know, the scariest he was was when he was he's like making making these kids feel scared. And it's just that that's really it. They're just in a cage floating to nowhere. Remember when Steve Rogers told Natasha there's only one God, ma'am, and he doesn't dress like that? Yeah. Idiot. (laughs) <laughs> moron <laughs> um <laughs> you've, you've met several gods face to face asshole do you think uh did they mention jesus they said there's a guard of car- carpentry oh did they yeah that's definitely got to be jesus yeah they're so afraid they have the zeus they have all these other gods bring the big g in man <laughs> you mean big j no big g oh big g just god god, god. yeah yeah that was uh the god at the end infinity eternity yeah that's a god that that was kind of scary. If I saw a creature like that, <laughs> I'd be like, what are you? Yeah, Jesus is like the Thor, because he's like the sun. 
But he's also good. I don't know. It's all so confusing. <laughs> and even Jane as Mighty Thor, uh, I didn't feel like she had a, a great moment, a great Thor moment. And I think her great Thor moment, I think some people actually liked it when she's like, it's Dr. Jane Foster. And that's kind of all cool and all. And I'm the Mighty Thor. And she does a stupid eat my hammer joke. And it's like, that's a problem with the MCU as a whole. But I think very apparent in this movie, they didn't let any of the big moments sit without a joke coming right after him. Yeah. And um, once again, the action. It's like literally within that whole sequence, uh, what's supposed to be a moment gets derailed by me because of that stupid eat my hammer joke. Yeah. Because it's a callback from a joke earlier that didn't land. Right. (laughs) So we're just going to double down on that joke. They're like, oh, they're going to love this when we do this nice callback. But the action in this movie, it is just a lot of superpowered people flying around and hitting CGI'd monsters with their weapons, and they go flying. There was no, there was no real tension in these fights where you kind of felt the punches uh, between these characters. Like when Thor fights in the Avengers movie for the first time, and it's him against Hulk. That's just a great fight. It's something that we've always wanted to see. You know, who's going to win? We always have these conversations. Let Thor and his villain have that type of fight. You know, the first confrontation they have in the village when he brings out all the shadow monsters and he kidnaps the kids. It's just a CGI dance, you know? Um, I guess the funny, yeah, I guess some of the funnier parts were Thor's jealousy of Mjorn the hammer being now with Jane and uh, uh, (laughs) Stormbreaker getting a bit jealous, you know, not, not, using the Bifrost the right way and all that stuff. Because once again, it, it speaks to Thor's sort of, he's lost. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't know if he wants to go back to the to the hero life. Uh, you see him in the beginning where he's really depressed until he has to really save the Guardians there. That could have been interesting, you know, really hone in on that stuff. But instead, it, it felt like, you know, you needed more time to really flesh out this story and that's not something the mcu seems to be focused on these days it's how much content can we get out there you know we have these scheduled release dates uh and we need to hit them but the cracks are starting to show with some of these stories and it's not necessary because you're the biggest studio in the world everyone's coming to come out to see these movies you don't have to rush it you know you you are you're already king it's it feels like they're trying to catch up now Uh, who are you chasing at this point are you that fucking greedy? <laughs> because to, to make the most money in the long run, if you want to break your endgame numbers and your Infinity War numbers with Avengers 5, these stories really matter. Yeah, and I think too, like, with just hearing the Christian Bale talk, like, about things getting left on a cutting room floor, and if this movie was two and a half hours, then I'd be like, okay, sure, that makes sense. But when you're barely scratching the two-hour mark, and it's very evident that, you know, your your film's missing something. Uh, It's just a weird decision for me. Yeah, definitely. You can argue that he's one of the weakest villains. As good as he is in those scenes, just his impact on the story for me wasn't there. So you just know where it's going. There was no surprises with his characters. There was no, oh, shit moment. This guy's a bad dude. Like you got with Thanos, or you got with Loki at times. And then he's gone at the end. And uh, and that switch is so easy. You know, why don't you just wish for your daughter to come back? Duh. Yeah. Fucking moron. I mean, that's a selfish wish, by the way. What would you have wished for? Billion dollars? No, like, I don't know. Donovan Mitchell to the Knicks? Gallic intergalactic peace. I don't know. Oh, God. You're such a fucking hero, aren't you? Um. Anyway, Eternity. That's the thing that Thor knew about, that he could access due to Bifrost. Yeah, good way to stop Thanos, huh? <laughs> good way to do stop anything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, also, um, you think him from- giving the powers to everybody that you could do that? <laughs> I mean, those things. Yeah, it, it's always fun when they reveal something new, and it's like, oh, this could have been used in a previous movie, or I, that's the first thing that came to my mind is Thanos just tell Peter Dinklage to make you Stormbreaker and just go wish for half of life to to be dead. You go have a nice chat with uh eternity instead of collecting all these stones it's not as fun i guess you know it's about the adventure it's about the journey it's a quick fix i don't know yeah the kids fighting uh, at that point i was already checked out of this movie you know fuck them kids (laughs) it was just silly uh and then you know that jane is going to come and sacrifice herself and then she ends up in valhalla Mm -hmm. with heimdall maybe that's them saying she's she is finally done because for a long time it felt like she was it felt like she was never going to come back I but think. once again, they, they've done the comic with Jane Foster as Thor, and it was huge. It was very popular. There was a lot to pull from that story. Some people say it's the best Thor comic in years. And then when you adapt it to the big screen, this is what you do with that character. Yeah. There's not something more. When you drop the trailer, it's like, whoa, Jane Foster's back and she's Thor? 
what the fuck? How are they going to explain this? What is she going to do? What's the relationship going to be like? And then it just ends up being very predictable. Yeah. There's nothing about this that was really necessary. I mean, I guess, you know, to bring her back and she has her sacrifice, but this could have been a Wikipedia post for me. I could have just read this summary and been like, okay, I know what happened just in case I need to reference this uh, for future movies. Yeah. Um, And what pisses me off is they're not moving the story forward, which is fine, but doesn't that give you more of a license to be more ambitious, to try some new things when it comes to your story? I'm not saying it has to be a radical change, but maybe Thor doesn't need all the screen time he got in this, and more of it could be given to Gore and Jane Foster as these characters. Yeah. If it's going to be a Thor movie and there are two Thors, he doesn't necessarily have to be the main guy. No, just like, I mean, we've seen... You mentioned before, I mean, he's been here since phase one, most solo movies. He's been in every team-up movie, pretty much, except for Civil War. So, like, we know we've gotten enough Thor. I mean, half of it was spent with a different kind of Thor, but that's a whole other story. But, like, I think he's the one character you can step back from. Right. Just because we've seen, you know, some of his struggles portrayed in other movies. Like, the same things he's going through here. He went through in Guardi- uh, in Infinity War and then in Endgame and things like that. So, like, it's not something you really have to hammer home again. Yeah, it could have been, like, you know, he's going to confront Gore for the first time. Gore's on his god-killing mission, and he's no match for Gore because he's a bit on balance he's unsure of himself and then maybe that's when mighty thor swoops in to save him uh and that's their reunion because it ends up just being he sees the hammer floating around and (laughs) it's like oh where have you been buddy (laughs) that was actually kind of funny when he was Mm -hmm. trying to grab it as well uh and it's just kind of an underwhelming reveal you know for them to cut out that scene of her transformation it's like they weren't it was just something for to drop in the teasers to get people in seats and i'm interested to see how much movie uh how much money this movie actually does make and you can argue Thor lost at the end. No, he very much, yeah, he kind of, he just straight Jane's up Jane's dead, and then she, no pun intended, foisted this kid on him. What the fuck is that? <laughs> Excuse me? And it's, you know, the, the guy who, wait, the guy who tried to kill me for this whole movie's daughter, who I've never met, you're just going to die and leave me with the baby? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to raise this kid. And they hint that uh, he wa- he's always wanted a family. He wants to be a father. And Cork says he would make a good father. But Not like it's this. Just, no, yeah, it's very... <laughs> right, the whole movie, this guy just kidnapped children. He's killing all your buddies. And then uh, then he just fucking dies and leaves you his daughter. He's like, here, raise her. Uh, I guess. You know, he seemed to be... You know that's actually Chris Hemsworth's daughter? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Nepotism. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she's actually good. baby. And, um... A literal nepotism, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, yeah, Gore's like, well, like, he's like, oh, I don't know what to wish for. Like, this sucks, because yeah, I'm going to die. She's like, oh, no, she'll be alone. She's like, no, she won't be alone. I'm like, yeah, that sucks, you know? Yeah, that's fucking, yeah, no. You can wish this cancer away, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been nice, huh? <sighs> Just someone who's, you know, I, well, now that, that little girl, I don't know if she goes back to the comics, um, kind of this child of eternity but maybe i don't we'll know see. who knows how much of a role she's going to have moving forward because you know the whole title ends up being about those two mm-hmm. they, they are love and thunder uh, but yeah with gore uh, that's going to be um such a missed opportunity for me uh it's something i'm never going to be get, never going to get over because when you have christian bale man it's christian fucking bale dude yeah. come on and as good as he was in those scenes, it's just not enough. I thought the voice was great, the the facial expressions. He was, he doesn't phone it in, man. He goes a hundred percent at everything he does. So for, it's like from a filmmaking standpoint, you have to honor that. Like it's not only the reputation, but it's the commitment. You could have had something really special here. And I think when you, you look at Dark World, you look at the first Thor. I guess Loki's a good villain, but he's more of an anti-hero. Uh, and then you look at Ragnarok. Who, who, like who's Thor's great villain I guess it's Thanos because they have yeah the most time together I, I think in Infinity War out of any hero and the villain yeah they got real beef that was real beef and the yeah. impact on him but man, this could have been Thor's guy you know and Marvel's history they do this all the time one shot villain kill him off at the end you're never gonna see him so yeah. I, I don't think the the impact I guess is giving him that kid but I, I wish the impact would have been more of yeah gods do kind of suck and I need to be better 
you know, maybe I don't need to go around killing gods, but I mean, I need to be the one who makes sure that some of these gods stay in line. Mm -hmm. Um, With a movie like this, I am going to approach it with what I would have wanted to see because this felt so half-assed. Yeah. Like they were just relying on, oh, Tyke is going to make this funny because he's hilarious, but I don't know. It didn't feel like the Ragnarok feels like there's so much more improv. Like, they are really riffing with each other, and I didn't feel that whatsoever in this movie. No. And I think the absence of, uh, like, Goldblum really does, it, it hurts. <laughs> well, I think Goldblum was scrapped. He was scrapped. one of the best parts. Um, who else was scrapped? Right, he was straight up just scrapped, and yeah. there were some other, uh, Dinklage. Yes. I don't know how much of an impact he would have made. And I guess, you know, Ragnarok, just kind of the whole setting of that movie ends up benefiting the comedy. But just not as funny. The action wasn't as clever. Um, and the themes are underdeveloped. I hate to say it. I hate to be this harsh. It has to do it sometimes. <sighs> like a Latiti? What? Zeus was the best part, though. The hands down. To well, me, that was funny. Brett Goldstein as Hercules. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I love Brett Goldstein. Yeah. Love Roy Kent. I'm not sure if I see Hercules when I look at him, but maybe he just kind of fits the the, the way they establish the Greek gods. Yeah. You know, I guess that's an appropriate Hercules. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think he was actually pretty great. And it's pretty cool, though. I think we can have like a Thor versus Hercules movie. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. But isn't Disney doing their own Hercules also? Live action? It was going to be weird. Just had to, around the same time, we have Hercules portrayed in one light and then in the Marvel movies portrayed in another. <laughs> right. Well, they could cross them over since I guess they, they own both of them. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I would love to have seen Thor fight Dwayne The Rock Johnson's Hercules. That's a Hercules. Mm. That guy's fucking jacked. Now he's Black Adam. That doesn't look great. I don't uh, hate it. Okay. I know you saw that trailer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, is there anything else you want to talk about when it comes to Thor Love and Thunder? Um, I hate to be this this way. You can bonk me if you want, but my goodness, Tessa Thompson. <laughs> that was... I gave this movie two stars on Letterboxd. One star was just for her. Yeah. And for them to cut out the scene of her licking the sword, that was just... What a missed opportunity. That would have been two and a half stars. Really? Just one scene. Yeah. She's just so cool. Bonk. I just want to be her friend. <laughs> no, it's not even like that. It's not even like that. I just want to be friends with her. <laughs> I wonder if she friend zoned me, that would be so hot. <laughs> That'd be good enough. What if she um king zoned you? <laughs> like we're not even friends, I'm just your superior. That'd be um, even hotter. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm her fool, I'm her uh <laughs> just <laughs> just entertaining her. You just got fool zones. Yeah, I'm fool. You're in the fool zone, boy. <gasps> Juggle for me. Not yes, King. <laughs> nah, she is. Even in the when in the beginning when she was in the suit, I was mm. like, damn, she could rock that suit. <laughs> uh, um, let's see, anything else? Uh, I mean, it's like Bao, the god of dumplings, was so stupid. <laughs> yeah. You know what? But if they would have, they should have just doubled down on the wackiness. Because it almost felt like, I don't know. It just it, I don't know. It was just all over the place, this movie. It is what it is. My little cousin, I saw it with him. Uh, I promised to take them out to the movies. He's got a, he, he's laughing genuinely, but it's, it sounds sarcastic. So every time they make a joke, he'd be like, ha, 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 ha. I was like, is he making fun of this movie? It sounded like he was mocking the movie. Like, I had this little kid next to me, not impressed with uh, Taika Waititi's humor. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, that does it for Thor Love and Thunder. I don't know if you have anything left to say. No? Not really. Yeah, let's move on to uh, U.S. Week in Box Office. Uh, yell at us in the comments if you like this movie. And if you didn't, you know, you can agree with us. Give us a thumbs up. And if you give us a thumbs down, nobody can see it anymore. Yeah. So just might as well just give the thumbs up. Yeah, th- thumbs up if you want to be represented. All right, no surprise here. Number one over the weekend of July 8th to the... Oh, wait, no. I'm on the wrong week here. Well, Thor did open to 144 uh, in the U.S., but over this past weekend, it uh, came in at number one again with forty-six million. Uh, number two was Minions: The Rise of Gru with twenty-six million. Number three was Where the Crawdads Sing with seventeen million. Number four, Top Gun with another twelve million, and Elvis came in at number five with eight million. It's a big old movie. Yeah, no, it was a big weekend for that generation. I'm happy for them. Yeah. I'm glad that Hollywood is starting to cater back to them. I had these five Golden Girls walk in before me, and like they're ahead of me in a concession line. 
You have to get tickets now, and they wanted to go see the Crawdads. Oh, okay. Yeah. We're going to need captions for that because you you, <laughs> you slurred a couple of your words. It's early. It's an yeah. early pod. I'm still jet lagged. You're still jet lagged? You've been back for like five days. <laughs> Two. <laughs> really? Yeah. I thought you got back on uh, Friday. Sunday. Oh, shit. Yeah. Will you extend the trip a little? Hanging yeah. out with Zeus and those boys? Yeah. So Thor, uh, Love and Thunder, $250 million budget. It's already at $500 million worldwide, so we'll see where that ends up. Uh, Minions is at uh, also 543 worldwide on an $80 million budget. Man, those movies are, they money know how to machines. make money. Yeah, they are. Uh, Top Gun Maverick worldwide is at $1.2 billion. Let's go. Keeps Good. just bringing in those $12 millions, $10 millions, $15 millions every week. It's very impressive. Uh, Elvis uh, on an eighty-five million dollar budget is at one eighty-seven worldwide. So it looks like it's going to be a hit. I think if it if it keeps going steady here. Yeah, it's a little. I mean, no Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, no Bohemian Rhapsody. No. Um, what did Rocket Man do? Let's look that up. Well, Jurassic World is already at nine hundred million <laughs> worldwide. Uh, those movies, man, they just need to die. It's crazy. Up, they're the new Transformers. People yeah. just go out to see them. I mean, Elvis like dropped at a bad time. I feel like you're sandwiched in between all these movies that are making close to a billion. I mean, with Top Gun, who had long staying power, um, Jurassic World still holding an audience. Thor now coming in. Yeah. So Rocket Man, forty million dollar budget, and made one ninety five worldwide. Oh wow! So made a profit. Uh, and I think Elvis will. I, I, I it's definitely going to make a profit when you. It may have already made a profit. I don't know how much they marketed this movie. But yeah, it feels like a movie that would have been better served in the winter or even August. This year's August movies are pretty bad. It's looking like a dumping ground like it used to be. You know, you can't drop anything big in August. So I think if Elvis would have dropped that first weekend, it could have been a really big hit moving into the fall. Yeah. But uh, who knows at this point. It seems to be doing well enough. Uh, Can't really call it a flop. And I saw it. It was good. It's it's no, by no means a, a great movie, but uh, I think it had a lot of the same flaws as Bohemian Rhapsody. But Top Gun continues to be the big surprise of the year. Uh, that's the movie everyone's talking about. Sony came out recently and said they paved the way for Top Gun's success by dropping Venom 2. Shut the fuck up. Sony's so funny. I love Sony. <laughs> They're uh they're Kobe fans trying to get in the LeBron Jordan debate. Yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about Kobe. <laughs> Love Kobe. Rest in peace. <laughs> Top five. Don't kill me. <laughs> that's absurd. Yeah, that's very much about like it's like, oh yeah, look what we did. <laughs> like we <laughs> Like, yeah, You're you, welcome. You, you made some money, but like, don't get it twisted. We're not in the same level, right? And like, their whole premise of the argument was: we took the chance. No streaming services. We're just going to put this out in theaters. But they weren't the only movie to do that. I mean, No Time to Die came out and mm-hmm. had big success. Mm-hmm. Um, Tenet. <laughs> yeah, Tenet came out like <laughs> in the pandemic. People but, still in like hazmat suits. Yeah, seriously. <gasps> that was kind of crazy looking back on it, man. They I, really I went to Jersey to see it. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. Empty theater, though. It was pretty cool. Me and Teddy were supposed to go with you, and we just decided not to go. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah. So, like, other movies made money besides Venom, but whatever. And to take uh, put No Way Home in that and put that on your back is fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny, man. Like, Feige wasn't controlling every aspect of that release. Right. Well, well the idea to bring in all those Spider-Men. I mean, sure, they had to okay it. Uh, and they get some credit, sure, mm. but yeah, to say we drop Venom too, and then No Way Home, and we just opened up the floodgates here. Thank you, Sony. Thank you. It's so more much. important than the vaccine when it comes to the, the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Right. Not you know the cases being down and mm-hmm. vaccines and getting a better hold of things. No, no it, was it was Venom too. Venom yeah. two made people unafraid to go to the movies again. Yeah. Uh, so they walk so Top Gun could fly. But Top Gun, like I said, it's it's the movie of the year in terms of how successful it's been, and it also is good enough to justify all the success that it's having. You know, the Black Phone also, man, they're, they're continuing to make mm-hmm. big-time money on a small budget. So Scott Derrickson, fired from Doctor Strange 2, goes on to make a, you know, back in his wheelhouse of horror movies, small budget, and it ends up being a, a big hit. I wonder how Nope's going to do. I hope it does well. I'm so excited for that. Based on the, I guess we can transition to that. It's shot in IMAX too. I'm excited about that. 
Um, yeah, they're marketing it as a movie you need to see in IMAX. It's the cinematographer from Dunkirk, who's done so many great movies over the last few years. You know, 19... No, wait, 1917 was Deacons. Mm -hmm. I confused them. Uh, but he's done a lot of great movies over the years. I, I think it will do well. I, I Look up the numbers for us. Obviously, Get Out had that incredible box office run. Yeah, and I think Us still did very well as well. Yeah, and I don't, like you said, like I don't really know what's being dumped in August. So this could have a couple weeks to itself where it really is... And I think word of mouth always works best with horror movies. Yeah, and Jordan Peele, I mean, Us made $255 million worldwide on a $20 million budget, so very similar to the numbers that Get Out did. I think his name does sort of carry, and that him doing the comedy really helps with that because he came into directing as, you can argue, an A-list star mm -hmm. just because of the success of Key and Peele. Uh, so now a Jordan Peele film, I think that name, it's sort of like Tarantino or Scorsese where it brings people out to the... To the, the IMAX theaters. will bump those numbers a bit, so I'm right, sure. Yeah, I think it's going to be big. Yeah, and the, based on the reviews, man, people are saying that this could arguably be his best movie yet. It's it's very ambitious. It's got shades of Spielberg, Tarantino, and of course Hitchcock. The the horror references as well. Okay, the way he blends horror and comedy, he really is the best at that. You know, and I think sometimes he's obviously huge, but his name does get a little lost when we talk about Ari Aster and Robert Eggers. Yeah. He's right there with these guys. He may be the best out of the three. You know, if he starts off three for three, because I loved Us. Get Out, obviously, it speaks for itself. Yeah. I thought Us was a little... I still thought it was good, but I, <clears throat> I don't think I don't put it at the same level as Get Out. So I feel like if he puts this one in between those, then, yeah, it's a solid three that can go up against... You know, you know, if I'm if we're, if we're debating and I have those three in my back pocket, you can really do like you can make a strong argument for anything. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think with him, Eggers and Aster and, you know, that's like us all making movies at the same time, all making movies within this year. Right. Isn't is a uh, yeah. disappointment Boulevard coming out this year? Yeah, it does. I think it comes out in the fall. Yeah. Yeah. They, I think they've always dropped the same years. Was it uh, Lighthouse, 17, Oz, 19 and, and now. Hereditary. Uh, no, Midsummer was the same year. Yeah, 2019. So I know Midsummer and Lighthouse were. Yeah, and I think Us was early to, uh, okay. 2019, and then 17 was The Witch, Get Out, and uh, Hereditary. They did it on purpose. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. They should just keep doing it. Right. Every three years, it's just a new horror banger, or two and three. And uh, Peel, well, what he does it would be, I think Ari Aster's turn because I think Get Out was the best of those three. Then I think. The Lighthouse. Lighthouse was the best of the other three now. Right, yeah. Right now, I guess The Northman would still be number one. Well, I love well, The Northman. Right. <laughs> it's the only one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see if he can keep that. So it would be, yeah, Disappointment Boulevard, movie of the well, year. Well, it looks like it's shaping up to be another three no, good movies. Numbers don't lie, so yeah. put all your money in Disappointment Boulevard <laughs> being better than all, all the rest. Uh, I've seen a, a common criticism of no. Most of the reviews have been very positive. Was Wait, that actually? it's it's too ambitious? Is Hereditary better than Get Out? It might be. Um, it's close. Yeah. So maybe nope. It's going to be the better movie. I mean, you can even argue The Witch may be better than. I think Get Out's still better than those two, but mm -hmm. The Witch is very good. Peel does such a great job of embracing the silliness of filmmaking. People complained about the logic in us. How does this make sense? And I think Peel really cares about that. It's more about the themes and it's more about the thrills, getting lost in your movie. It's not about thinking about how how can this make sense logically. It's just what is this story trying to convey when it comes to the emotions and the themes and the different things you can do with filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, because we kind of know what Nope is going to be about. But like I said, I've heard that it is very ambitious and he throws a lot of ideas out there and it's it's sort of difficult to piece everything together that it's a movie that warrants rewatches and that's always been my favorite type of movie so i think i'm going to really enjoy this based on everything i've heard especially when it comes to the to the negative and i think reviews. The all the trailers i've seen have been perfect yeah so i still yeah. have no idea what the movie's about right i mean just seeing that Al yeah sure goofy aliens, ass like ufo i love that mm -hmm. shit you know flying fucking saucer that's awesome mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere it's a sexy ass cast too man those four leads i don't know who the third guy is but steven yoon uh tech daniel guy. kaluuya yeah yeah, yeah. And Kiki Palmer. Yeah. Um, yeah, him and that a cowboy get up is, is great. <laughs> or all of them. I guess they're all like ranchers and cowboys. I'm so, like, what, what's the deal with that lady who looks up at the sky, right? She freaks me out yeah, every, every time. Yeah, every time I'm like, yo, what is going on here, bro? Yeah. 
I'm excited for that. Yeah, and like even just from the trailer, like uh, Kiki Palmer seems to be like very uh, more of an eccentric character. Where yeah, Kilo's Kuh- Kuh- like very like low key. So that's always it's a, a fun, it's a fun dynamic. dynamic. Yeah. yeah. She she looks like she's really hamming it up. Yeah, it's probably she's gonna be like, you're not gonna believe like aliens. He's gonna be like, oh, I want aliens. aliens. Oh, come and the on. aliens come. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, aliens. Yeah, you were right once again. My wacky sister I need to learn how to trust you. I like how she's uh she's getting a shot here to transition from being a child star to being a movie star. Yeah, so I think I don't know if that... she was kind of lost for those few years. You know, it's like where, it's... where the hell did Kiki Palmer go? Because we watch Alice. Did you watch Alice? No, I didn't see Alice. That came out this year, right? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't great. I think she was good in it, but right. I feel like this is definitely more of a mainstream type, more eyes on her. So Yeah, we'll see how it does. Uh, all right, you want to move on to fan questions? Let's do it. That's for the fan to decide. Yay! People, you call up to the show, you better be ready. That's what you're supposed to do sitting there arguing and you're trying to spell your name and all of this other stuff it's not your show it's my show i'm giving you the, the opportunity to speak your mind don't call up here unless you got something to say uh this question here from nick lester favorite strain of weed strand of weed hmm. uh you know what i'm classic hybrid sativa indica i recently read that a lot of these uh strands of weed are bullshit that there's been so much crossbreeding that anyone who can actually think that they know what a weed, what type of weed that actually is, is kind of lying. Because when you fully test it, there's so many different ones because of all the, the crossbreeding. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a weed guy, so I'll let you talk about this. But yeah, I'm a weed sommelier. What, what is it called? Somal- <laughs> sommelier. Sommelier. Yeah, there you go. I always, uh, I always get these ideas. Like Sometimes I'm just like, uh, I want to give it a shot again. I'll try to be a weed guy. Be a weed guy again. Do like a weed podcast one day. That would be t- actually that would be terrible. I would have to go home halfway through because the last few times I've done it, I just had s- terrible experiences. Not fun, and which is so weird because back in the day, like high school, I used to no problem. That was kind of my thing. Now I take an edible and I, you know, have a complete meltdown. Yeah, I, I, maybe it's because in high school you're just kind of more f- f- like a free-going person. Yeah. You know, there's not as many responsibilities. I mean, high school students are under a lot of stress. But weed, when you're an adult, I feel like when people take it, they're just expecting it to go bad because adulthood sucks, you know? Yeah, I wish I could just vibe with it. Like, when you see the movies and people do it and, like, you know, how they it's portrayed in media, it's like, ah, oh, that's what I want, you know? Well, they're not really high. I just want to feel good and, you they're know, actors. eat some dominoes. Well, that's the thing. You need to do set and setting. Yeah. You need to smoke like I do. Don't smoke and go out or smoke with friends. Just set a game plan. I'm going to get some dominoes. I'm going to watch Godzilla. I think I'm going to cry. <laughs> last time I did an edible was I was in the city with my uh, yeah, what the f- my First ex-girlfriend's terrible setting. friends that oh, I've never God. met before. Oh, no. Never met before. This is the worst setting. Like, I was pretty drunk, and one of her friends was like, you want an edible? I'm like, sure, I'm game. I don't want them to think I'm some nerd. I was just sitting there, all in my head, just like, I'm like, I'm, I'm acting fucking weird right now, right? And like, yeah, definitely am. This is not good. And then in my whole head, I was just like, I was just going fucking crazy because I react very bad to weed. Bad decision. And I'm like, I just need to go to bed. Yeah. You it, it can't was do that. Fucking don't do that. Terrible. Try it next time. Next time you want to watch a long movie, you know? Smoke that good stuff. No, because halfway through the movie, I'll be like, fuck, I'm, I'm 30. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should just, yeah, just stop with the weed. Yeah. I think people underestimate that it is a psychedelic, you know? It's it's similar to LSD but and Everything else mushrooms. doesn't give me, weed like, gives me the worst effect. What it, start taking mushrooms. Start microdosing. Similar effect. Yeah. That's what, that's what I think. Like, Do the drugs. I, I'm trying. Okay. This question here from uh, Schuler underscore Ethan. What are your guys' thoughts about Westworld Season 4? Well, my thoughts would have to be some people seem to like it. Yeah. I've heard some people say it is kind of a return to form, like Season 1, like Season 2, that the mystery's been cool instead of just confusing for the sake of being confusing. I'm interested in... I think I've gotten more interested seeing people's reactions, but I still... I, I might just wait for the season to be over to give it a shot. I was on a plane for like 20 hours this past week and didn't think of downloading it once, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I was yeah. just kind of waiting for it to um, wrap up. But yeah, it seems mostly positive. 
so far. So I, I don't think I, I mean, season three was definitely not to the standard as one or even two, but th- there's still something there that I think intrigued me. Um, so yeah, if the season ends and people like that's still the consensus that return to form and the mystery's back and it, it brings something fresh to the series and I'll definitely check it out. It's waiting for uh, the right time. Yeah, I think I'm on the kind of same page. I may check it out sooner than you do. Right now, I'm watching The Bear on Hulu. I heard that's is, amazing. Yeah, it's been really, that's really what, fun. I don't like watching new things on airplanes. Uh, yeah, I'm, the, I'm kind of the same way. A lot of people download stuff. Yeah. I go with whatever's on the, the plane. I've downloaded like some new things and old things, and I, I just kept doing... Because I like to be able to... Like, I put on Goodfellas, because it's just something I'm familiar with. I can watch it, and I can also do other things. I was playing, this, like, the Switch. Something new with all the everything that's going around, being stopped, uh, hearing the background noise of the plane. It's just not the right environment to watch something new. I found TV shows are much better than movies, though, when traveling. Yeah, you could just go episode by episode. It makes the flight go faster. Yeah, you just knock through a few episodes of Curve, and next thing you know, it's, you're like, three yeah, hours yeah, in. Look at the half, halfway there. Mm-hmm. I watched uh, Come On, Come On recently on a flight. Mm-hmm. I got suckered into it. I'm, I'm the same way. I like watching stuff that I've already seen. I don't like the plane setting. I don't mind no. flying, but it's just uncomfortable. So I'm not in the right space to fully watch something. But Come On, Come On was terrific. Where are you on the recliner? I didn't do it because I don't do it. Because somebody did it to me, this most recent flight. And uh, fucked up my movie. I had to look down the whole time. But you can recline too. I didn't want to do that to the person behind me because I thought, what if the person behind me is also watching this movie and enjoying it? You They're know, built to, f- like that's poor. That's, why do they have it if you can't recline? I think it's it's more so it pits people against other people I when know. they should just be giving us more space to begin with. All right, scenario. Going to the airport back in the day used to be like going to a fancy place. The planes were spacious, cigarettes. Yeah, dude, airports, uh, international. Yeah, people used to get smoke. dressed it's up. Fucking insane. Really? Yeah. Damn. Um, but seven hours, I can't do sitting straight up. And we picked our seats, we checked in, and made sure that we had emergency exit, so extra leg room. Mm. So at first, I was like, I have all this extra leg room, but I'm like, it's not the leg room, it's my back position. So I ended up reclining. My girlfriend reclined, got a tap on her shoulder. To go the back l- up. Lady behind her. Yeah. Wow. Did you go back up? Yeah. She's like, oh, sorry, I didn't know I went back that bad. I'm like, I'm like, are you kidding? Like, I got mad at her. Uh, oh, so she did ab- abuse it. She what? went back way too far. Well, she didn't realize it at first, but then okay. she went straight fully up. And I'm like, well, she's probably out of Xer. I'm like, excuse me, miss, are you reclined? That, and she probably like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. Oh, okay. So you're mad that she gave up so easily. Yes. And it's an international flight, so it's a little bit more spacious right, than yeah. other flights. It's yeah. not like we're packed in uh, going to whatever. But yeah, I was very disappointed. I, I, I wouldn't have stayed. I wouldn't have given up so i think that's two yeses to we are going to watch westworld yes but our thoughts so far are we're intrigued uh this question here from ollie underscore b aaron versus teddy part two when <laughs> teddy still needs to pay up for his other bet i'll not make any other arrangements with him until he gets waxed. Didn't he double or nothing for something else i thought he double he looped that in for another bet i don't think so yeah i think if he can't remember it then it doesn't count yeah he's just got to pay off that debt and yeah but he's never going to do it, so... Um, well, that would be a better race. I think that you've gotten in better shape since that first race, right? Yeah. What did you say? And Teddy's probably gotten in worse shape. Yeah, I would smoke him. I was surprised that you came so close the first time. I underestimated you. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. Well, no, But it's, now I, I would... Yeah, I'd bet, I'd bet on you. But, like, since then, like, I've been running. Not, right, like, yeah, yeah. not like training for Teddy, but, like, just in general. Like, from that point, I, I don't think I've ran in... I don't know how long. Um, so, yeah, I'm in, I, would, I would smoke him. Teddy, if he's going to win, it would have to be the more time he lets pass, because it's only going to get worse, because he's going into dad mode. You know, that's just life. He has more responsibilities. got the kid. He's got a fucking dog. He's got the soup. He's juggling a lot. <laughs> yeah, but it, I, th- I think it would, I wouldn't want to do it <laughs> just because it, it would. Yeah, no, that'd be – you and Nash would be better. Yeah. Nash is a bit more, you know, active these days. He runs weird. Ever seen him run? Yeah, he charges up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's got the Nash Turbo, man. Yeah. Hits that R2 button. <laughs> yeah, he off. fucking spams that shit. <laughs> uh, this question here from Shakir underscore OHC. Who's your favorite character in Naruto and why is it Itachi? Well, obviously Itachi is the best character because of the 
to, what do you like? I think he starts off earlier on when you first meet him. You don't really know what his deal is, but as as the show progresses, you kind of learn more about him. You get that backstory. You find his motivation. It's a he, right? Yeah, yeah. You find that motivation. And it just makes everything going forward that much better. But even even everything you've seen up until that point, you kind of have a different appreciation for. And it really just all comes together very well. Yeah, I think that was vague enough. Yeah. Um, but there is still a lot that I don't know about him up until this point. Okay. Because, you know, what we've gotten. So he's a very mysterious guy. Mm-hmm. Bad guy, too. Oh, Not no. a good guy. Not a good guy. Okay. No, no. But there is a lot that there are hints being dropped that there's more to his story than they let on in the beginning yes so i've heard that his character only gets better but he is a badass character man his powers are fucking insane the way he tortures people he puts them in like this own little mind prison and just kills them over and over again for a certain time period he's 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 a sick fuck Mm. he's older brother to one of the good guys Oh, that's yeah. that's a fun family dynamic. Yeah, there's a little, there's some tension there. Uh, but I, I, th- I said this on one of the last podcasts. It's Rockley because he's the man and he's got the best hair. Um, this question here from Zan: Dune Part Two production has begun. Who are you looking forward to seeing the most in the sequel? Probably Austin Butler as Elvis. Yeah, <laughs> is he playing? He's going to be Elvis, and yeah, I just saw Elvis last night. It was a fine movie. I don't think it's it's a one of the best of the year. It's Are you got a, a Baz lot of boy? Baz boy. Yeah. I appreciate him for, yeah. for the way he stylizes his films. I think he's he takes a fun approach to filmmaking. I think this story would have been better served focusing more on Elvis rather than the Tom Hanks character. It seemed more concerned with the scumbag manager than the iconic musician. But Austin Butler was phenomenal. It's one it's the same thing as Bohemian Rhapsody. And I I know a lot of people have turned on Rami Malek over the years since he won that Oscar, uh saying it wasn't a great performance and it was overrated, but I thought it was good and I thought Austin Butler as Elvis, he really did lose himself in that role. So he's an up and coming talent. I think the movie is it's having its cultural moment. People are kind of having fun with it whether they liked it or not. They're kind of just appreciating how wacky it can be at times. And the character of Elvis, I think that people are you know, there, there's this new interest in his legacy of who he actually was, yeah, you been know, the watching, way he performed and stuff like that. Lot, I've been watching a lot of videos about, like, of like actual Elvis and reading up on him lately. Interesting guy. I mean, obviously, we've seen how just how his life kind of spiraled and what, you know, fame during that era, or even any era, like what it could just do to you. But um, it was nice, like, it's fun going to see back those first impressions of Elvis and how he kind of took the world by storm um, but I think it's Christopher Walken that, that intrigues yeah. I don't know much about the Emperor character um, but from the little I've heard about it and just knowing Christopher Walken and um, kind of the reactions to that casting I'm very intrigued to see how that all plays out yeah that is a very interesting choice I think uh, and uh, you know the new casting that we just got for Leia Sado. You know, she's always just great in everything she's in, whether she's one of the main characters or one of these supporting characters. So they just continue to pack out this movie. Um, And uh, people have been wondering about the turnaround here. Four-month production, you think a year for post-production to put the movie all together, and then it comes out at the end of 2023. You know, it's it's close, you know, for them to just have started filming today um, but uh, or yesterday. Does the Emperor (laughs) interact? Earlier in the week. Yeah. Does the Emperor interact with... uh Sting Harkonnen I couldn't think I couldn't remember his first name but I know Sting played him in the original Austin Butler's character uh I think so okay yeah yeah cause I wanna interact yeah yeah they do with uh I don't know if they also, yeah, how he's many playing, lines I have he's playing the Sting character right Austin Butler I think that is the Sting yeah. character yeah yeah um, the nephew the Harkonnen nephew right yeah I can never pronounce his name Fade Ratha <laughs> think that's it hell yeah fade or something some shit like that i want to see them interact but wait why 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 austin butler and christopher walken so i want him to do elvis and him doing like straight up old school characterization of christopher walken (laughs) i think that'd be very Uh, yeah i wonder if he's gonna be able to lose that elvis accent because they're saying it's a permanent yeah but like i think a lot of people pointed out like 10 years ago like he was a child it's like oh of course his voice changed over the years they play like two clips of like when he was like a nickelodeon star Oh, yeah. <laughs> was he? Austin Butler? I think he's Nickelodeon, yeah. Wow, look at that. Or Disney Channel. I'm, I've been obsessed with the idea of nepotism babies in Hollywood, so whenever there's a new up-and-coming actor, the first thing I do is check their background. 
What do we got? And I start to judge them. I, I haven't done it with Austin Butler yet. It, I don't. It breaks my heart. So I guess we can do it right now. Let's see. If his old parents got the, if their name is Blue, you know what to do, and that's what they say, right? You click on it. Um, which ones? Which ones I pointed out to you? They're like, ooh. Dakota Johnson. Dakota Johnson. Yeah, yeah. that was that, that was a big one for me recently because uh, I, it hurts more when you like them because it's like okay, I, I'm still a fan, obviously. I but. think you could like uh, Fifty Shades Dakota Johnson if that was like your first impression of her. You, I think you could throw out the nepotism, but she's actually proven to be like really good. Yeah, she's a movie star. Um, I think it's very similar to kind of like Elvis, where it's like Elvis is good. Mm-hmm. You can't deny his talent. But he got that mainstream success because the media allowed him to. And I think that's the case with a lot of nepotism yeah. babies. You grow up in show business, you may have a natural skill to be an actor because you, you've you just been around it. That's been such a big part of your life. It kind of makes sense that you would follow in your parents' footsteps. Other right. professions do that as well. But, you know, at the end of the day, there are a lot of talented people out there that don't get the yeah. same opportunities. Like Maya Hawk, I think, is good. So, like, it's not like a... She's considered often the best nepotism baby. <laughs> well, in recent <laughs> yeah. years. She Rashida seems to be Jones. the favorite. Well, yeah, no, that's a bad example <laughs> yeah. where it's like, damn, she just keeps getting work. Uh, now she's getting work opposite the guy from Drive My Car. Damn. Colin Hanks. Well, <laughs> yeah. Chet would have been a star Chet. regardless. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, that's a... Sh- you can't stop that star from shining. Uh, Jack Quaid. Dennis Quaid. Yeah, wow. Mm. I never put that two together. Carl Urban, Keith Urban. <laughs> Part of the illustrious Urban family. Yes. But yeah, that's how it goes. Urban right. Meyer. How did, we get, how did we get here? What was the question? Oh, Doom Part 2. All right, let's move on to something else. Did we find out if Austin Butler's an nepotism baby? He's not. No, he's got normal parents. Well, normal Doctor. in the sense that they probably shoveled into show business against his will at a young age. Well, actually, he was discovered at 13 oh. by um, an acting management company at Orange County Fair. That's also, you know, but you can't, you got to give him that. Yeah. So people get this. John Morant, dude. I think people don't realize with professional sports, exposure is so important that there are plenty of people out there that could have had careers in the NBA, but they just weren't exposed to oh, the right people. Well, the right answer is Bronny James. There, that's the perfect one. Yeah, yeah. no, he's going to get an NBA contract just because of his dad. Uh, although he's been jumping a little higher lately. <laughs> um, this question here from Matt Sampson. Will you guys be watching and or reviewing C- the Captain series on Derek Jeter? Definitely going to watch it. I don't know if that's out already, but I think hell yeah. Tonight. I mean, the nostalgia I have for the Derek Jeter-led Yankees is so strong. I think about it all the time. A hot summer's day, got the TV outside playing, you know, the old TVs, the Yankees were on, the grainy pitcher, Michael Kay calling it. Ugh. I don't think I've ever been obsessed with a particular sport or team than those Yankees. Yeah, they Baseball, feel so important to my childhood. Middle school, I was the biggest fan of anything like more, biggest fan of baseball, more so than I am now with hockey or football. Um, it was it was really baseball and basketball, which is weird because now they're like I would put hockey and football above them. Um, I'm getting more into baseball again, especially with the video games and just being, I guess, more inclined to just sit home and like relax <laughs> it's and getting just old. Throw on the Yan- yeah, <laughs> <laughs> getting old. That's why they're like, oh, baseball fans are always so old. It's just yeah. well, old people are always watching baseball. But I could tell you any like when I was a kid, I could tell you any lineup uh, for the past like ten years or the starters or the stats. I was just obsessed with baseball, and a lot of that was just because of the Yankees. And it wasn't even obviously the core four Yankees. It was more of the the Sabathia, J- AJ Burnett era when they got and then the Shera, A Rod, and. All those guys. That's when I was mostly into it. Probably 2006 on. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I have such vivid... I I feel like I grew up in a religion based around the Yankees in my house. Yeah. My dad was an obsessive fan and uh, just always talked about the history of the team. So they they were having the time of their lives in the 90s, those fans Mm -hmm. who grew up, you know, with the teams of the 80s and how they struggled in the early 90s, and then they got that that dynasty of their own. But I'm I'm so excited for that. Like I said, I I love Derek Jeter. I, those years for me were some of the best years I've ever had as a sports fan. Yeah. Even after you know, like I remember the series so vividly from 2000 and on. So there was a lot of pain and suffering between 2000 and 2009 <laughs> I think his last game ever I was in college and or his last home game 
when yeah. you had to walk off. Like it was a a weekend. It might not even been a weekend night, but I just remember there was like a huge party going on that night. Like all my friends in the house, like we were all going. And I just I stayed in to watch it and got like some pizza. And yeah. I was like, when he did that, kind of like close. I think that like closed the book on like my super fan of a baseball. Like he got that walk off, and I kind of just. Not that I, was, I still pay attention and watch it, but like that was probably the last time I was like, besides playoffs, like must watch the Yankee game. Yeah, I mean he's probably the most beloved New York athlete of the last three decades um, by a wide margin, Think and I still argue great, with people to yeah. to this day about is he overrated, is he underrated? He's still so <laughs> kind of a controversial figure in the larger scope of baseball fandom, but I think it comes with the territory of. I think him having so much exposure throughout his career and being so, so famous. So many people have called him overrated now that he's actually underrated. I think that has happened with yeah. him. I think people truly don't appreciate just how steady of a hitter he was every single year. Look at how the, great like, of a yeah. hitter he was. Look at it today. You don't you see have, guys hit like, like that for a career. He bat 320, next year they bat 260. Yeah. It's, he's consistent 300, give you 20 home runs, you know, the, being that leadoff or two hole, just a consistent bat for two decades almost like and the clutch play did matter man that guy elevated his game in the playoffs every time that's why those teams were so great the 98 yankees it was two hall of famers with mo and jeter in their primes and the rest of the guys were just good players to really good players i mean think of mike trout obviously mike trout head and shoulders talent was better than their jeter with the speed fielding and obviously the hitting he got called up 20 21 years old obviously he's been hurt and had injuries, but he's considered the best player of this generation. He's not going to get to 3,000 hits. He might if he extends his career to 40. Yeah. And it is consistent the way he's playing. But, I mean, just look at <laughs> Jeter's consistency and just racking up over 3,000 hits in this era and um, never missing He would have had a legitimate shot at 4,000 if he yeah. didn't get hurt. Because th- th- that was the word, that he was just going to keep that thing going. What yeah. did he finish on, like 3,300? Something like that. I think he got 3,000 in 2,000 and... 3,400. Yeah. 3,465. So, I mean, he lost he lost a couple of years there, I think, getting hurt in that ALCS in 2012. There's always, like, the debates on ML- <laughs> MLB The Show forums because everyone wants to judge Jeter card, and they always argue about what his defense will be. <laughs> it's like, because he won the gold gloves, and everyone's like, yeah, but the metrics are the fucking metrics. terrible. <laughs> terrible. Uh, last question here from Jay Katsu. Is A24 overrated? I think a lot of people miss, I mean, it's, I think, because it's not like they're not directly producing those movies, distribution, and they right, buy but they up do a put lot of, a lot but, of money behind these right, movies. And, and they, 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 they are very selective, I would say. Right. Um, with movies that are not your typical mainstream films. Um, I think that when you compare them to other others, I think their hit rate is a little bit higher than most. It's impossible for me to call them overrated because they're not like a DreamWorks or a Disney where they're a mainstream studio. Everyone knows what A24 is. Everybody can't get enough of A24. It's very... Their movies do well, but Everything Everywhere All at Once, I think, is their biggest hit. And it wasn't this worldwide box office phenomenon. It did well for A24. So... I don't think they're big enough or well-known enough to be overrated. Maybe you could say film fans get a little bit too excited with A24 movies, and if it's an A24 movie, the hype just gets built around it that this could be an Oscar contender or this could be an all-time classic. But like you said, their hit rate has been so successful. Not Mm -hmm. all of their movies are good, but every year you expect an A24 movie to to be in a lot of top 10 lists and best of of end-of-year lists. Yeah. Uh, because they they really do manage to put their money behind people that are trying to stretch the limits of what filmmaking is throughout the years. So that's why they have this reputation. Yeah, but I think we've seen others like pop up that kind of share in the same space. I feel like Neon has done really well as of, uh, as of late. Um, I, I do get like sometimes like, oh, A24, it's about to be a banger. And I think they've had a few misses, but for the most part, at uh, you know you're getting something that's creative filmmaker driven and i think that's positive in that sense at the very least yeah i think they've they've had a positive impact 
on filmmaking as a whole just because of like i said their support for indie filmmaking their support for smaller movies because it's getting harder and harder these days to produce movies like that man people are telling absolute horror horror stories about working in hollywood for a studio other than marvel or dc even in streaming people are starting to feel that impact of what's happening to netflix where a lot of these streaming services aren't putting their money behind some of these passion projects or i forget what was the word that netflix used for it was it it was passion project how they described the irish right yeah they were like we're not going to going to do movies like that anymore so uh, i think <laughs> if you're in the space of like uh, f- uh t- television on streaming services that seems to be the best way to tell original stories um that you don't have to try and check off all these boxes of gaining mainstream success i mean netflix considering the irishman like lumping it into that category is insane it sounds good for investors right because but it's of, like martin scorsese and probably one of the yes. most commercially successful directors uh who makes great movies and accolades from critics and fans that always does well at the box office right wolf of wall street was a box office success maybe yeah. netflix should look at itself in the mirror and say we didn't do enough good enough job marketing this thing mm-hmm. to make it more of a success because if they're complaining about all the money they pumped into the irishman make it more of an event mm-hmm. give martin scorsese what he wanted he wanted that theatrical window for more than just a month i don't think that it was more than a month right we had to go to some fucking yeah we went to some rinky dink yeah. theater not rinky dink but it was rinky dink it was rinky dink yeah, my back is still hurting but yeah uh, i think netflix you know they've uh, they've kind of ruined things for a lot of people over these past few years because of some of the decisions they've made and they were praised for it at the beginning because they were backing all these projects but mm-hmm. They've been so reckless with it. So I, I think with A24, it's no, I, I, you can't consider them overrated because especially at this moment right now, they're, it's, they're so important. So I think they should only be, you know, praised for what they're doing. It doesn't mean praise every single movie that comes out. You judge them based on how good or bad they are. But in terms of their overall efforts, I think that they're properly rated mm-hmm. and they deserve the recognition they've received. All right, guys, that does it for the Nerd Suit Podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. Um, make sure you come back and join us next week. We've got some videos in store, and we're gearing up for House of the Dragon, man. That's only, I think we're less than a month away, right? About a month. Yeah, August 21st. So excited for that, excited for the Lord of the Rings series, and uh, excited to just, oh, for my birthday. My birthday is this weekend. What day? Saturday. Oh, happy birthday. Thanks, man. All right, guys, see ya. <laughs> Damn, we were making some good points in that video. Hey guys, Aaron and Nerd Suit Monkey here. Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. What can I say about you guys that I haven't already said about myself? You are the most important part of the channel and the main reason we keep going strong. Like Bo says, you keep the lights on in the fridge so the fridge is full. Or, or something like that. So, from everyone here at Nerd Soup, I'd like to thank you guys for your continued support. If you're interested in joining the ranks of our patron supporters, head over to patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out the rewards we offer to our patrons. We recently dropped some new stickers for you guys to check out, or you could choose a tier that will allow you to select a movie, show, or video game for us to review. We've got a full slate of fan-suggested reviews coming your way, and we're really excited about the chance to review some of those movies and shows. We've also got t-shirts, mugs, behind-the-scenes videos showing how we bring our videos to life. And once again, thank you to all our Patreon pledgers who have been supporting us throughout the years. Without you, we wouldn't be able to convert all your pledges into cryptocurrency, so thank you from my future self for making us rich.